The wisdom of the guides here in central Colorado is that baby brown trout are the major prey fish in the upper Arkansas River, my home river. So I've been trying to work on a baby brown trout pattern to use there, mostly in the fall, which is prime streamer time in the Rockies. The design I came up with, the white belly matuka, is an attempt to modernize this classic minnow pattern into a full-bodied pattern that swims well. So why a white belly? Why start with a white belly? If you search the web for freshwater minnow images, like seen here in this composite image, most prey fish have white bellies. And my experience in the upper arc shows that the, this includes baby trout. When I look to modify a pattern, I do a web search for the imagery of the target. In this case, prey fish. The goal is to find common design elements between the prey fish species that are then used to control fly design. This YouTube video clip you're seeing here is showing grazing minnows in flowing water in the Ozark Mountains. And it illustrates important design elements for streamers. First of all, as the minnows turn and feed, they turn up their broad silvery flanks and white bellies that reflect daylight that we see here as bright flashes. As you can see, these are quite noticeable even at a considerable distance through the cloudy water as they are coming from feeding minnows in the background of the scene. Secondly, I notice prominent detailed coloration and lateral lines on the flank of the prey fish that are to me critical elements in fly design because the trout often strike from the side of the minnow and aim for its head. So the look of the minnow's flank is an important clue to show the predator, one, that this is food that they are familiar with, and two, to show the key elements like the head that appear to act as sort of a map of where to strike. Of course, there are many ways for a trout to approach a fly and strike it. But in my experience, there are two general approaches that trout use. One, come up directly behind and attack at the tail of the fish, where all fish have a blind spot. Second is a flank or broadside approach, mostly ambushing the prey fish from, say, an undercut bank, a bucket, or in the case of the upper Arkansas, some soft water along a rubbly riprap river bank, which is very common on this river. In the rivers I fish, then, the flank approach and assault is the most common strike that I see. So if the look of the flank is a key trigger leading to a bite, then a baby brown trout design should show prominent par marks like you see in the naturals here in these videos. While some think that par marks function as camouflage, to me, and as you all can see in these videos, the par marks in these salmonids appear to make them stand out from the background more than obscure them. In any case, the par marks are distinctive flank markings that likely trigger strikes from the larger cannibal trout in the upper Arkansas River, where I mostly fish. A Yet almost all baby brown trout fly patterns that I see in this composite image have, have no design elements that look like par marks. Most seem to use a general coloration scheme of what the designer thought a baby brown trout looks like, but few have any features resembling par marks. Simply put, it's the par marks that identify a fly as a baby trout, and adding those to a fly may close the deal for a strike rather than a follow, a bump, or a miss. Bringing all these observations together and designing a baby brown trout streamer, it seems that the fly should have maximum motility in the movement of its parts to allow it to be fished and recognized as a troubled prey fish, as well as the proper flank coloration suggesting a baby brown trout. For maximum motility, the white belly matuka uses reverse tied mini marabou feathers they're also called grizzly marabou or the, by the trade, trademarked name chickaboo. The mini marabou feather is used because it, it makes its, their proportion properly for a two inch fly like the single hook white belly is. Today we're tying the uh, baby brown trout variant of the white belly matuka. I've already put the hook in. It's a size two Gamakatsu uh, B10S. It's a stinger hook with a wide gap. You need this wide gap because we're gonna put in quite a bit of material in here. 
and we want to make sure we have enough point exposed for good hooking. I've already put the cone head on and I've got a backer bead and the, as you can see these cone heads are pretty pretty loose and what the, the backer bead does is it will stop it'll stop it from flopping. It may rotate but it's not going to flop on your uh, on the finished fly and that's important. Um, after we've <clears throat> I'm using a 50D nano silk, which is a super strong thread, so we can really torque on the body and make it strong. Um, I'd also like to say that the I'm not going to show you all the recipe parts because the recipe is given in the comments section at the start of the at the YouTube uh, video page for this fly. Okay, now what we do is we we put a thread base back here. And we're going to tie in the tail and we tie it in a little past the hook bend and the thinking is is that this may inhibit the tail whipping around and hooking up on the on the hook point um, but it does make the tail sort of drag down a bit but we're okay so i'm going to tie in a deceiver type tail and th in this case the ki the uh, quill is to the front and usually you would just continue on and tie these barbules in over the top to make the mantuka wing. But what we're going to do is reverse tie that wing part. So we tie in the tail, cut it off, and then tie in a reversed uh, portion here. And the idea is that that's going to really enhance the action of the fly. So the tail's going in. I like them to go in about a, uh, one and a half times the shake length. And we're going to make sure that that comes off on the top of the on the top of the hook. So we're doing this in line. We're going to do a belly underneath the hook shank and a wing and tail on top of the hook shank, but it's all in line. And that's what the advantage of using a rotary vise on this is. You can then align everything. You're looking down on the fly, and you can align it on top with the hook bend. Like that. And we trim. Now we're going to bring in the body, which is cactus chenille. I cut off like a five inch piece of that. I cut off, pull out some of the fibers at the start to give me the uh, bare thread to tie with. Tie it on and get a firm foundation, a firm tie of the body. Because we really want to torque on the body when we're coming forward with it to get a very tight body that will be the foundation of the uh, of the uh, wing that's going to then be lashed down by wire over the body. Where's my wire? All right, I'm using a small silver ultra wire. I cut off about six inches of it. I want plenty of wire because I'm going to be wrapping and weaving this wire through the through the feather, the wing and the belly feather. I also tie the wire in a little head and then leave a tag in so that I can bend that over and lock it into place like that. Okay. Also, because I'm going to be bridging between the deceiver type tail and the matuka type wing that's reverse tied, I'm I do tie in a rear tuft of of the grizzly marabou to give me a, a better fill in between. So I just strip off some of the feathers, form up a tuft of feathers, and then tie that in like that. This is to prevent a gap between, or help partially fill the gap between your wing and the tail. Okay. So then I come forward and I start, I put a, a ball of thread right behind the backer bead and start forcing it into the cone and break off. Sometimes these cones have rough edges out on the end of the machining burrs or something 
and it'll cut your thread if you're not careful, and I wasn't careful. Okay, so I have like a wedge of thread formed, and now I'm going to bring my body forward. So I get a couple wraps on, pulling back the uh, uh, mylar fibers maybe give you a fuller body. I don't know. Some think it does. Then I tighten it. Every three or four turns, I pull it tight. I do a wrap or two right behind the backer bead to force it up into the cone further. I lock it in with three turns and I cut. Okay, now I'm going to weave the thread back through the back or be the uh, body to the rear and try not to tie down a whole bunch of threads. I still have to tie in my wing feather and the belly feather. <sighs> All right. So the whole key in this reverse tie, so in a reverse tie, the quill is going to be out to the rear. You got to pick your feather. You can see here, I'm sort of, seems to me that this upper part here is a much better portion that's going to give us a lot, much larger fibers. And so I prepare it by stripping off above and below the uh, webby stuff. And then I cut off the lower half of the feather like that. So this is going to go... the back of the body and I've already started a few feathers over as you see behind and again I check to make sure I'm on top looks good okay and then see I tied down a feather you gotta watch this all right I'm not going to cut the quill yet um, so then I have the white belly feathers here, which are just chickaboo or mini maraboos as they're called. And again, I'm going to inspect the feather, trim off the part that I don't think is the better part, the better half of the feather, and trim it down by half. And this also gets reverse tied with the quill to the rear. So this is kind of the crux of the fly. It's the most difficult part is getting these feathers started and tied down. So I leave the quill on because then I can pull the feather back into position where it's easier to pull it back into position. So I'm under, under the fly. It looks good. And so now I'm going to start, I bring the thread forward again, weaving it through the body. Okay, now I'm going to tie off the bottom feather. I sort of groom the feathers back. I'm trying to get as many fibers as possible to the rear. And again, I'm going to check to make sure I'm underneath. Three turns to lock, and then I trim.
now for the upper feather. The upper wing, I should say. And I'm going to lock it once. I'm going to position it up on top. Inspect. Looks pretty good. Okay. So I'm going to put a front tuft in. I think the problem I have with tying this fly is finding the uh, mini marabou's long enough to tie even a, this is a one inch shank basically. And so I have to supplement it with these tufts, the rear and, and the front tuft. Returns to lock and trim. So then you can start to see the wing forming up. All right, now we're going to trim the quills. And we're going to start the wire forward. So again, I'm opening up a gap in the Matuka wing feather, and then I come across and get the belly feather. I got to check and make sure I didn't want tie a bunch of barbs down. And I'm sort of grooming it as I pull up to make sure that the white belly feather stays underneath. It tends to ride up on the side on you. Check here, how many tire feathered barbs have I tied down? three or four terms of the wire to lock it in place. And I'm trying to force it down behind the cone. Three turns to lock that. How we do? Looks okay. So I've laid, I tie these sparse. So this I've used one feather each. And sometimes if I can't find the right feather, I'll go to doubles. Same as the tail. But the downside of that is you tend to inhibit action. The more feathers, barbs that you have in there, the more they interact with each other and inhibit the movement. So that's the balance point that you're trying to, to get to is <clears throat> enhanced action or more dense feathers. Now... As you'll see in the tank test following this fly tying video, these things look pretty dense when you get them so in, in the water. They, everything folds back and into a very hydro, hydrodynamic shape. Um, okay, on to the flash. I tie the flash back into about the halfway down the tail on either side about mid-body. And as we saw in the, uh, the introductory videos, we're trying to introduce this side flash that these prey fish seem to have. Uh, they have very silvery uh, scales or something that causes a, quite a bright flash. Um, I'm tying this under the wing. And so it does, I'm trying to get it so when we put on the par mark feathers, that'll help hold them down. For par marks, I use the uh, streamer grade 
freshwater streamer grade net, uh, rooster feathers, which are broader than a dry fly feather, as we see here. And the idea is this is going to look like the yellowish flanks of the par marked baby trout, baby brown trout. Okay. The other thing is um, if you don't build up ahead of the body, the thread base under there enough, and it's narrower than the body, then it'll wedge the feathers out when you tie them in. So it has to be equal to or greater than the diameter of the body. And I use the leave the barbs on intentionally, as you see here, because I, I think they help control and um, set the feather uh, in place. So I'm really trying to play with this feather and get it to lay flat. It's vexing me today. Okay. All right, the final element that I put in are these what are par marks, which are sil amber colored barred, barred amber colored silicone legs. And uh, these are just really, to me, are action elements. So it's another way to provide another bit of action into the fly, and it does suggest the yellowness of the flank of a baby brown trout, as well as more barring, which is typical of them. But it does, be, it is a free element that, uh, that just flaps. And it, it, again, it is parallel to the body under hydrodynamic forces during the pulse of retrieve, but then they droop when you stop retrieving. So. This is kind of like uh, Gallup's peanut envy and that you have all these floppy elements on there and it seems to be, although not realistic, it's very attractive to the trout. All right. So I'll put a couple loose ones and tight ones. And then we, um, I put in a collar of, uh, of the uh, dark olive ice dub and I, I wax heavily, and you can see I just trapped some feathers on there. I mean, some dubbing fibers. And then I spin. I don't really dub in the traditional sense. This is a spin dub with the wax that holds it to the thread, and it uh, binds it down when you spin it. So there you go. Makes it quick, easy dub. There. And then I come in behind the, the cone head and whip it. I double whip finish and no cement because the cement just gets out in those feather barbs and makes them stiff. I've never had a double whip finished one come apart for that matter, unless it's really been chewed on by the fish. That's the brown trout variant of the white belly matuka. And we go on after this to uh, put this into tank tests and you'll see that these feathers have a much enhanced action. in the water. Anyway.
This is a tank test of the uh, white belly Matuka tied in the brown trout style. I've added a uh, <clears throat> yellow olive barred grizzly feather to look like par marks on the side, and I've added a, a yellow barred silicone legs to look like a lateral line. Then I've tied an olive, dark olive barred grizzly marabou over the top, and it's a reverse tie. So at rest, you can see that the feather sticks straight out. But when, when we begin to jig it, we get great action from those feathers as they smooth back into an aerodynamic form. You can see also that the tail has a very nice swimming motion because I've used all these soft feathers. So there you are. So, But at rest, again, the feathers come out to the sides because of the reverse tie. There it is. The white belly Matuka. So here's a white belly Matuka tied in the traditional or classical Matuka style with a single feather that's tied in at the rear and extends out for the tail at the tips and then the <clears throat> rest of the feather is tied over the back of the hook by winding a wire through it. You can see that this has the single tail feather has the best action yet of the ones we've been looking at. But the uh, the feathers barbs tied over the back of the fly because they've been tied back as we jig it don't have the enhanced action that the reverse tied uh, feather does. The reverse tied grizzly marabou that we tied in the other models. This fly has excellent action though and uh, I would use it. Also the other innovation of this is it uses these, uh, the more modern style of uh, using silicone legs as lateral line to make it look a little more brown trouty. So I went down to my local fly shop and I asked them for an imitation that they would suggest for baby brown trout. And this is what they came up with is a, uh, a woolly booger tied with a black and olive tail and a palmered brown hackle and you can see when you tie like the, even the marabou tail back they've tied it too thick and you're not getting good action here and the hat rooster hackle that they use it's not they should have used a soft hackle on it because so, it's not giving any action it doesn't fold back on onto the fly and give you a, a breathing action when you jig it or retrieve it 